everybody it's joy a while back I had posted a video where I had gone on a hike and found an owl's nest in a rocky outcropping also in that video I had posted a couple of pictures of some Native American Indian artifacts that I had found on the property when I was on that hike as well I had stated then that I would do a future video on some other artifacts that were found. The owner of this property has actually found quite a few artifacts and has elected to leave them on the property. In the past he has taken a couple of them back to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde which is now the tribe in charge of those artifacts. He was told what they were and also told that if they did take those artifacts from him that they would remain locked up and cataloged and nobody would ever see them. Um, that was a bit distressing for him. He thought rather than do that he would take those artifacts back and put them back on his property where he had found them. And so, you know, um, I respect that decision. For myself, any of the artifacts, with the exception of the one that I will name that was gifted to me, um, all the rest of them, I have taken pictures only. Uh, the artifacts remain where I have found them. I don't move them other than to maybe reposition them a little to get a better picture. Having said that, since I'm going to show you some of the beautiful artifacts that I found in this area, I thought it only fitting to give a little bit of the history of the natives that lived here so that you get a good understanding of the people whose work you are looking at. When researching the tribes that inhabited this area, it was inhabited mostly by the Malala tribe. During the warm months, these mostly nomadic people left their mud, cedar, and hemlock bark homes to freely roam parts of the Willamette Valley. The upper Malala used dugout canoes and were also using horses by the early 1800s. The southern Malala lived east of present-day Eugene and Roseburg in what is now the Umpqua National Forest. Both the Malala of the mountains and the Malala of the valley also had strong ties with the Kalamath peoples who they regularly traded with and who it is said called them the people of the serviceberry tract. The Malala of the mountain region adapted to hunting the larger game of that area and the Malala of the valley's primary diet was roots and small game. Hunters camouflaged themselves with deer heads while stalking their prey and were renowned amongst neighboring tribes for their use of skillfully trained dogs for tracking and hunting. Malala expertise also extended to fishing salmon and steelhead. The tribe developed a tradition both of spear and basket fishing. The latter used 10 by 12 foot vine baskets suspended on poles to catch fish under waterfalls as they were herded into the baskets with brush fences or by throwing stones. And that was pretty much the life of the Malala until the arrival of the white settlers. By the mid-1800s, the Malala tradition of hunting and fishing became seriously threatened by encroaching white settlers, and it would not be long before their very lifestyle was under siege. As more pioneers pushed westward, native hunting grounds began shrinking, causing Indian settler tensions to mount in the Malala country and in 1846 the peace between the two communities was nearly lost. It was preserved only by last-minute negotiations. By two years later, inevitable violence broke out near Abiqua Creek in present-day Silverton. Although falsely called a war by many non-Indian historians, native peoples have a different story to tell. The real story, says Grand Ronde Cultural Resource Specialist June Olson, is that the same period, 1848, was about six months after a neighboring tribe's attack on the Whitman mission, and the settlers in the Willamette Valley were afraid there would be an Indian uprising. She says when a horseback mailman happened across Klamath travelers camping with their Malala hosts, 
he sounded the alert that the group was preparing to attack. But Olson says what pioneers thought was an army of male warriors was really a group of women, elders, and children. She notes the mailman probably thought he saw a band of Indian men because Malala men, women, and children traditionally wore deer hide trousers. Blinded by fear and ignorance, the settlers took arms and attacked the group, killing about 13 and wounding one. Olson says the elders, women, and children fled as aggressors pursued them to around Abiquaw Creek. For dying a warrior's death, one of the women defended the group with a bow and wounded a soldier in the shoulder, narrates Olson. But when the attackers caught up with the band at the river, she says, they realized what they had done and were so ashamed they rode off leaving the woman to care for the wounded. Striking an agreement with the U.S. government, on May 6th and 7th, 1851, Indian Affairs Superintendent Anson Dart secured treaties with the Northern Malalas and the Shampui of Oregon as part of a U.S. campaign to acquire the entire Willamette Valley. The original intent was to relocate all native tribes east of the Cascade Mountains, but Malala peoples, like many other Western Oregon nations, refused to move so far from their traditional homelands. There were six treaties signed at Shampui that comprised 19 pacts initiated by the U.S. government with Willamette Valley tribes that year. Four years and a new superintendent later, Congress finally acknowledged the agreement. However, Congress was quick to recognize a spur on white settler land grabs by passing and upholding the 1805 Northwest Donation Land Act, doled out free acreage to westward bound pioneers decades before formal treaties were signed with the Aboriginal inhabitants, a policy that Olson says heightened tensions between Indians and their new non-Indian neighbors. In 1854, Oregon Territorial Legislature enacted a ban on the sale of firearms to Indians, thwarting the capacity of Malala and other tribes to hunt competitively with their new neighbors for scarce game on rapidly shrinking hunting grounds. The following year, in 1855, Oregon Proclamation sought to confine Willamette Valley Indians to temporary reservations, charging them to account for their whereabouts at all times or be imprisoned. By November of that same year, diminishing resources and mounting conflicts helped Superintendent Joel Palmer persuade Southern Malala tribal leaders to move to the Umpqua Reservation, where treaty negotiations began. One month later, a treaty endorsed by tribal chiefs ceded Mountain Malala lands to the United States and the band of about 30 Malalas agreed to relocate to the Grand Ronde Valley. On April 3, 1950, the Court of Claims awarded the Southern Malalas $34,996.85 for reservation lands the 1855 treaty mandated they would share with the Umpqua tribe. The amount was awarded because the Malalas only lived there for two months before being removed to Grand Ronde. Today, despite a May 1955 Federal Register showing that 141 of the 882 members then enrolled in the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, which were of Malala descent, by the middle of this century, non-Indian sources began proclaiming the near extinction of many smaller tribes, and the Malala were no exception. It was not uncommon for photos such as the one of Fred Yelkis, nephew of famed Malala Kate and grandson of treaty signing Chief Yelkis, to appear in newspapers like the July 1957 Portland Journal, captioned as one of the last Oregon tribesmen. I am running out of time in this video, so what I'm going to do is I will end the video with still shots of all of the artifacts so that you can see them all, and then I will make a part two video and I'll explain and go into a little bit more detail about the artifacts. So for now, I'll show you the pictures. Please watch the second video for more detail.